Uh, early on in the process of trying to uh, deal with this leak, the EPA apparently advised uh, British Petroleum not to use these dispersants there. And I, I guess this was either ignored by BP or was overruled by the Coast Guard, but in any case, they were used prolifically. What was the basis for the EPA advice of that? What is the evidence that induced them to say don't use this stuff? The EPA had some data showing that uh, Corexit, which the ones that uh, BP decided to use, were more toxic than the other ones. So there was some less, what EPA thought were less toxic oil dispersants that could have been used. And it's really curious. I hope they do a lot more work to try to figure out why a BP just went ahead and used these more toxic dispersants. Uh, one of the theories is that they just had a lot of it on hand, and that comes up with a tangled relation between NALCO, the producer of this oil dispersant, and BP and other people that are using these things. So they, had, they just had a lot of it around, and it was easy for NALCO for some reason to ramp up production. But it's not real clear why they just totally ignored the EPA advice and why they didn't go forward with that. I think that's a great question. I hope, heck, they do a little bit more research on that. Or they don't, hopefully, uh, some study on that. Yes? That, that crude oil is different and that they're not yes. all the same. Right. So the dispersants that are being used or somehow were somehow matched to the crude that's no. being in the Gulf or no. they should work on any crude even though crudes are different? Well, the theory is they work on any crude, but it would be nice to have, you know, there, there's well known different types of crude and certainly they could do more work to match the dispersant with the crude and the contaminants in the crude oil. and. You know, one of the problems with the, you know, the crude, crude that came out of this well was it came out at a very low depth, came out a mile below in the ocean. So the contaminants that would ordinarily evaporate off quickly, the, you know, those low hydrocarbon products, you know, the, zan or the benzenes, the toluenes, the, you know, the ethanes, the various low, would evaporate off of the surface. So what are they doing at the low cold temperatures a mile down is a big question, how the oil dispersants interact with those. So it's really, it's a much bigger question that we didn't do the research to understand the consequences of using oil dispersants a mile down in the ocean. So there's really no data, no information about oil dispersants and their consequence, or were they even effective at that depth? You know, were, were they were interacting? Was there any reason to suspect that they would interact with the oil that was being released right out of the wellhead at that depth and temperature? Because oil dispersants have been designed to be surface applied, warm temperatures with a lot of agitation. You know, look at that NALCO video. It's a perfect example of what they did, but they don't talk at all about how these dispersants, the majority of these dispersants, the depth at which they were released. And they, we have no data. We have no idea what was really done. And it was true on those slides I showed. It was really just a big experiment that we have no the answer to. And there's no reason for us to be doing an experiment like this. There's, we know there's going to be leaks. You know, we know there's a Chernobyl, a Three Mile Island. We know there's problems, and we don't do the work to, in advance to understand what the consequences of what we're doing. So uh, assuming what you just said, um, are there other approaches, technologies that could be applied um, you know, uh, in advance of um, these leaks occurring that would either be effective on surface or for these um, you know, depth of you know, incidents? Uh, my understanding is the Norwegians, who have had a lot of experience with deep water dwelling, require much more different blowout preventers, and that uh, BP could have had a more robust preventer that was like $500,000 more. And the other thing you could do is require them to drill. What they're doing now is drilling that well that comes in on the side to block this one off. They could require them to drill a backup well to block a problem like this, you know, that is not a month out, two months out. It's only a few weeks out of a problem that it could occur. So there are things that can be done. They just cost more money. And I think the, we should look at what's going on in Europe, the Norwegians in particular, what they've done. They have not had an accident like this, but they have required their oil companies to be more preventive. And that really comes back to precautionary principle. We need to make more precautionary approaches to dealing with this, because the consequences are enormous. You know, and I hope, um, hope we understand that better now. All right, uh, I did arrive late, so I may have missed something, but uh, I don't understand why they were so hot to use dispersants in the first place. It seemed like it'd be easier to let the oil coagulate and pick up tar balls and, yeah, and not dis disperse it evenly throughout the environment to begin with. Right. So the question is, you know, why do we use dispersants at all? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's partly, you raised some really good points, and there was a group that came out and, uh, a scientific consensus statement saying that they should not have been using the oil dispersants they did, certainly not in the volume that they've done. And that's a real open question. And the tar balls are in some ways easier to pick out. The problem is those 
the tarball get into the w w into the uh, shoreline. They're hard to get out, hard to disentangle from the bushes. The uh, birds get into the sheen on top of the water. The whales and other amphibians come up and they get inundated with the stuff. So the theory is it disperses stuff. And I think, you know, I don't think we've really looked hard enough at is our dispersants really that effective because they break them up and these little oil droplets and dispersant droplets that are surrounded by, the, you know, minusculized, they are taken in by the gills of the fish. So the fish absorb these things, they're taken in, it's like they're breathing, they breathe this stuff in. They're down at 10 microns, so they're much smaller particles. It might be a heck of a lot better for them to be bigger so they just bump into them and bounce off of them and they're not taken into their gills. So I think you raised a great question and that's something we should not have to be talking about now. We should know the answer to this before we have a problem like this. So when, oh, so when you brought up the precautionary principle and we're comparing it to the FDA and we've seen kind of recently there's examples of how even with the FDA there's – you can't really prove 100 percent that remove all risks. So I kind of want to hear maybe some comments about if we had a good precautionary principle in place, what would that look like and still make something practical that you can actually approve something in some way? So it's a really good question. So the precautionary principle says you take action even in the face of uncertainty. And I think the classic example of that is with the tobacco industry, you know, where the industry, uh, you know, basically stonewalled the thing that tobacco causes problems such as cancer and such as nicotine being addictive. You had, uh, you know, industry executives standing up in front of us saying that, well, the nicotine's not a problem, it's not addictive at all. And so I think we've ignored a lot of information. So the precautionary principle says, you know, Take a few actions here. You know, first, have a lot of information. There should be transparency in information. There should not be this huge reliance on confidential business information. And we do not have transparency when it comes to chemicals that we're exposed to. Nobody in this room uh, signed a consent statement to be exposed to bisphenol A. And I can guarantee you everybody in this room is excreting bisphenol A in their urine because we're exposed to it all over the places. There's been some recent uh, comments in the media about them being on the back of our uh, checkout counter, you know, little slips you get from uh, – you know, your Visa card, stuff like that when you're in the grocery store, and that the operators in the, in the checkout counters are getting exposed to a lot more BPA than the rest of us. So I think the precautionary principle says, you know, we should have the information available to make decisions on the potential hazardous chemicals before we put them out into the environment and potentially do these studies. You know, brominated flame retardants are a classic example of that, where we put them in our cushions, we put them in our mattresses, and why do we have brominated flame retardants in our mattresses? Cigarettes, of course. But why do cigarettes burn? Because the tobacco industry set them up so they burn. They don't stop burning. I'm sure nobody in this room smoked a little bit of marijuana, but if you had, you know that you got to keep puffing on that marijuana cigarette to keep it burning. You know, it goes out if you don't. And uh, cigarettes should go out. Why don't they go out? Well, the tobacco industry put some accelerants in that, constructed tobacco so they continue to burn. You know, and that's just, you know, we're not making good decisions. And that's where the precautionary principle comes in. It says analyze who's making the money from the product and now how do we deal with that stuff and the person that's making the money should also bear the consequences of understanding the hazards and also have the con have the responsibility the ethical responsibility to share that information with us and allow us to be make good decisions both as a society and individually and that's just not the case right now we uh, you know BPA bromine flame retardants I go down the list you know, lead and toy paint, all these kind of stuff that and I think Washington State's doing a good job trying to control some of this stuff. But we do not have good rules about chemical exposures and, you know, having a good chemical policy reform. And that's one thing I encourage you all to get involved with is looking at that. You know, chemical policy reform is up at the national level. It's going to be up at the state level in the next session. But we need to reform TOSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, which governs a lot of this stuff and, you know, pr partly governs uh, oil dispersants. So we need to have better, stronger laws, and Europe is moving in that direction. We're way behind Europe in controlling the chemicals we're exposed to. And the precautionary principle says basically give us the information and be reasonable about this stuff. And the FDA has done that. I have a, a note card question from the back room. Do you have a sense for how much adequate testing and experimentation of potentially substi toxic substances would cost? You know, um, that's a good question. I don't know exactly how much would it cost. You know, they talk about putting new uh, drugs on the market being $600 million and things like that, but that's a high estimate given some drug that's 
you know, a real blockbuster type of drug, but it'd be a lot less than that. And in the FDA, we have a very defined thing called the Red Book, and we know what tests to use. We have a whole litany of tests that we run through. We know how to do this. We know how to do uh, screen chemicals for their hazards. So I don't think it'd be that much to understand that. And we need to look at the volume of chemicals. And if you look at the REACH program in Europe, and they're doing that now, there's also a lot of effort on in vitro studies, doing cell culture studies, so we're not using all the animals in these animal-based tests. But I think there's ways to do that that's not cost prohibitive. And I think that's the cost of doing business. You look at how much something like uh, this oil spills cost or, you know, how much the health consequences. We, we allowed chemical industries to externalize the cost. How much did the cost for the cardiovascular and lung cancers that are uh, to responsibility of the tobacco industry? We let the tobacco industry make a fortune off tobacco, and we pick up the tab for the cardiovascular and cancers associated with tobacco use. You know, that's the kind of stuff that needs to be changed. So I don't think if you put it in that context, of what are the costs to the society and what are costs to health, it's a cheap investment. We get a huge return on investment. This is my inner critic talking, maybe more of a remark. Someone had asked why even use oil dispersants in the first place? Right. And you know, I was looking at, it, like many of us, looking at images on the internet, looking at images on the television and thinking, the reason that they used oil dispersants is that so we can't see the tar balls so that we can't see the oil sheens. And it's tr mostly, I'm, I'm, I was thinking, again, my inner critic um, being sarcastic, thinking, well, probably it's just so that it's a marketing tool, that it's a public relations tool, more than a cleanup strategy. That, that was my thought. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, yeah, I think there's good, there are some reasons to break up the oil and get them off the service because, uh, you know, birds, the thing, do fly into it, and it's it cause a big problem for that. So the idea is to break up the oil so they can be e more easily digested by the bacteria. But that makes, you know, then you've got to have oil dispersants that are not toxic to bacteria. And I think that's where we have not done all the research we could have and really planned ahead for this stuff. But there is, I think, some of the beauty part of this thing that you get rid of it. And right now, I think that's what's happening in the Gulf. They're saying, you know, the new CEO of uh, BP says, well, we can scale back because we're not seeing the oil. Well, they should invest in finding the oil down below the surface and figure out the consequence of this. You know, so I, th I think there is some truth that it, you break it up, you can't see it, and, you know, out of sight, out of mind category. Where it's really not, it's there, and what are the consequences of being there in these small uh, broken up droplets, and who's absorbing that, what bacteria is being killed by it, you know, what plankton, what shrimp are soaking this stuff up. So can you comment more about um, the consequences ecologically on a micro and a macro level? I mean, you talk about toluene and benzenes and so forth being evaporated. People are inhaling these things. And you talk about, you know, plankton and bacteria ingesting these, um, you know, oil dispersant molecules. Can we kind of walk through some of what the implications are of this from your perspective? You know, I, I'm not a marine biologist, but you asked two big questions there. One was more of an ecological, and one was also what the human consequences are. And certainly been reports coming out of the Gulf about workers being exposed to this stuff. Uh, you know, shrimpers that are used to dealing with shrimp and on their boats, and here they are out there dealing with uh, hazardous chemicals and bringing in the fumes that are coming off. It's like how many of you lean over your gas tank when you're pumping gasoline and inhale those fumes? Not something any of us do. And you know, one thing that always bugged me about Oregon, everybody been down to Oregon where somebody pumps your gas for you, right? You know, think about that. So you've got somebody at the gas station pumping the gas, and that person's inhaling those fumes regularly from all the, pump, all the gas they pump. You know, my view is they shouldn't do that just from a public health standpoint. They need to disperse that exposure amongst us all. So we're all responsible for being exposed to the hydrocarbons coming off our gasoline when we pump our gasoline and not, you know, put it on just one person pumping gas from a gasoline station. So we all get to hail a little bit of that. So that's what's going on in the Gulf. They are being exposed to these compounds, and uh, two butoxyethanol is one of them. What are the consequences of that stuff coming off that? Are they being trained enough to deal with the uh, oil dispersions and the oil, the evaporation of the oil, the uh, benzenes and other compounds coming off the oil? As far as the ecological stuff goes, I think the jury's out on that. I th don't think we have enough information to make an assessment. And I think the big question, again, is it toxic to the developing organism? Everybody knows that, you know, kids are not little adults. The same thing goes with little shrimp, you know, the plankton. It doesn't take, you know, it's dose response. You have a small amount of exposure to a very small organism, that's a big dose. You think of a flea, and that's why pesticides work on small organisms. We can be exposed to a little pesticide because they're really big, 
so it's a very small dose. But if you go on body weight, you know, then it's a big dose of something that's very small. So you've got to be thinking in sort of dose characteristics. And you put out 2 million gallons of oil dispersants, that's a big exposure, which means a really huge dose to very small organisms. And that's what we need to be thinking. You know, we take caffeine, and you take 100 milligrams of caffeine in your average cup of coffee, and for adult, that's not a big deal because that's, you know, a small dose given our body weight. But you give that same 100 milligrams to a small child for a 2-year-old to 3-year-old kid, they'll be bouncing off the walls. And the other thing you have to remember, like caffeine, we metabolize caffeine pretty quickly, you know, with about four hours or so, about half-life of caffeine. But a child up to six months of old does not metabolize caffeine. So are these little organisms metabolizing the compounds we're exposing them to? Probably not. So I don't think we don't have the information we need to know. And there's no excuse for us not knowing this stuff. We've got all the tools available to figure this stuff out. The problem is nobody wanted to spend the money to figure it out, and the industry didn't want to spend the money, and the government wasn't in a position to force the industry to spend the money. So I guess uh, one of the reasons I came tonight was to understand a little bit more about the, the, the science behind this and, right. uh, and, uh, and the hazards. Uh, but in terms of the uh, what I need to be saying to my congressman, yep. um, you know, you've laid out some, some broad things and some of the problems that we need to face, but um, if there's a message that we could send to our Congress people that would, that would um, leverage, I guess, the, the, this incident and the, and the, the damage that's, that's there, what would you say? I would say that you know, the, there was a bill that was put forward that was scuttled that uh, re was going to require industry to do more research on oil dispersants and uh, you know, the consequences of oil spills. But I think the big message is there needs to be a more precautionary approach to drilling in the deep oceans. And we need to have backup systems. We need to do the research to understand the consequences of the spills. There's going to be more spills as long as we're so dependent on oil and we're going to be dependent on oil for many years to come. We need to do more understanding of what are the consequences of oil, you know, the actual oil on these organisms, because oil is toxic material. Nobody wants to open up their car and drink a gallon of oil. But what are the consequences of use of dispersants? Coming up with better techniques. And we need to you know, require industry, just like we've done here in Washington State. You know, Washington State's got a big dependency in oil, but we've now, just in the last year, required that tug, really fully funded that tug, to be up there. And I, don't, I forget, I think it was like 42 incidents last year where the tug was used to uh, uh, shepherd some ship that was in trouble up there, coming through the straits. We need to have precautionary approaches like that. We need to require them to use better blowout preventers that are double checked, that we have inspectors down there looking at this stuff. We need to have a more robust system of guaranteeing this stuff is done in a precautionary way that's going to protect human health and the environment. And we need to, you know, there needs to be more regulation. I, I you know, I, I think we need a level playing field, and regulation is not bad. And that's, you know, that's one of the costs of doing business, the cost of extracting oil from this depth. We pointed out at that, at that time that there were 1,800 illegal oil inspections in the Gulf of Mexico in 1998 and 1999. Those wells are still being illegally inspected. We wouldn't need oil dispersants if we would enforce the regulations we already have. You know, you're probably absolutely right about that. And the problem is that, you know, we're not enforcing the rules we have. And why is that? Because this turnover, this movement of people from the government into the uh, regulatory positions and into industry and not being cautious enough and not, I think the public has got a demand from our representatives that they fully fund these agencies. I'm more familiar with the Consumer Products Protection Agency and how they did not protect children's health. You know, they let these kit, these toys with lead on them. It's the same, exact same thing that we are not, you know, using the rules and regulations we have to protect human and environmental health. And there's got to be more, we all need to get after our congressional people, after our state people, and we need to fully fund these agencies and say, you've got to be out there doing this stuff. And we can't have people, you know, going back and forth so well. We had that whole incidence with that, you know, the mining safety people that were in bed with their people and using drugs together and all this stuff. You know, that stuff is, we've got to have, more uh, honesty and more credibility in that stuff, and these agencies got to be well funded. I, I, you're absolutely right. I don't know what you do about that. You, we've got to have uh, more vigilance, more um, more people willing to uh, 
you know, here are the rules. It's a problem. There's got to be accountability. You know, I in agree. In 1998, the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard retired from the Commandant, uh, from pre-position as the Commandant. He yeah. gave a contract to a private yeah. company worth right. $44.5 million right. Dollars, right. and then became, a year later, the president of that company. Yep. And who was holding him accountable? Nobody. You want to go to your legislators? Ask them that question. Yeah. Why are we not holding government yeah. officials accountable? I, I totally agree. We need to have more accountability in our government, more you know, things like that that just should not happen. It's more of this turnover and the you know, ethical violations. We've got we to, we I think collectively, we've got to put more emphasis on human environmental health and say we, these people have got to be accountable for that stuff. I totally agree with you. Yes? Uh, hey, um, I wanted to uh, not really have a question. Uh, I'm actually a marine biologist and a bit of an oil spill chemist. and. Uh, I'm, I'm working on this bill. I'm probably in real trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, there are several things you said that would have uh, spiked me, but uh, in yeah. general, your, your, your tenor is, is fine. I you know, don't Thank disagree you. with your approach or anything. And several of your facts are a little astray, um, okay. but I just wanted to uh, uh, relate a couple of them. Uh, actually, dispersants here um, are being used to break up the oil. That's yeah. the main point because yeah. the uh, despite everything that we try to do out there, it's really the microbes that are going to clean up this spill. Yeah. We, we have no say on what nature's going to do, uh, but she's the one who actually mops it up. Same thing, I'm, I'm actually old enough that I worked on the Exxon Valdez also, uh, and that's the, the same situation up there, but much better here. So uh, what about the deep oxygen depletion then and things like that? that well, about? there is a natural oxygen, well, let's back up. The one that you hear about in the press is there's these o uh, oxygen depletion zones but they're up in the shallow uh, due mm -hmm. to the Mississippi muds coming out and uh, you know, the amount of organics in that mm. driving the, those shallows uh, out of oxygen. In the Gulf, there is a natural oil depletion uh, layer that's down about, uh, about 1,000 foot, 800 to 1,000 foot, where it, it actually dips down a little bit and as you're going down towards depth then it increases again. Um, and we've measured the oxygen in those levels uh, through the plume and uh, there is a little bit of a decrease, but it's, it's not as low as natural variability. So that doesn't seem to be a, a big issue here. Uh, we don't know where the dispersion is going, but we know that it is dispersing. Uh, we're not looking at rivers of oil uh, subsurface. We're looking at really barely detectable misty clouds. If you have a, an ROV down there, you really can't see it unless uh, the little micro droplets impinge upon something. You can see it with a particular uh, frequency of sonar, and so that's one of the ways that they're tracking it. But mostly it's uh, using fluorometers to look for the natural fluorescence of the oil. That they are, is the only way that they can really see where that oil is going. Um, there appears to be uh, the only visible damage at the moment. Uh, they are seeing these things called pyrosomes, uh, which are, um, if you know your, you remember from your invertebrate zoology, the, uh, it's a, a group of, uh, of ascidians, uh, siphonophores that form uh, kind of a gelatinous colony. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing those guys fall to the bottom. But those are the, and, and they are filter feeders, incidentally. Uh, those are the only things that we can absolutely put our finger on and say that we are killing those. Uh, pardon me, they are killing those. Uh, but that's the only known effect. Fish don't actually uh, absorb oil across their, their gills. Uh, oil is oil and doesn't go through. But uh, the dispersion could uh, affect some of the cellular mechanisms there. In the Exxon Valdez, the, uh, the impact was to the eggs uh, because they will, they're big fatty sacs and they will absorb oil. And of course, if they float up to the surface and there are surface oils there, they will be absorbed. Uh, there's also some uh, photoactivation that occurs in some of the uh, components of the PAH, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, where if they're inside, get absorbed inside of a transparent organism, the sun will actually, from UV activation, make it slightly more toxic, which is maybe an effect that we're seeing down in San Francisco during the, the Costco Busan spill down there a couple of years ago. So there's lots of really, you know, to me as a dispassionate scientist, lots of really interesting and challenging questions here. We've never had a spill at this scale We've never really had a scale or a spill in this particular environment that we've had to deal with uh, at this scale. And there's lots of questions, as you've pointed out several times, of oil coming up from the depth. Um, the several stages, they were actually injecting the dispersion in the wellhead itself. 
um, I was at the wellhead site and uh, talking to the guys and understand they anecdotally, yeah, they thought they could see a difference when they were injecting the dispersant, not as much as coming to the surface. And uh, um, these oil droplets, when they're coming out of the well down there, there actually is a lot of turbulence, so dispersant works well there. Uh, it's, it's like a super velocity steam jet as it was coming out. So that's actually better than uh, some of the surface applications where you need a little bit of wind and wave to make dispersants work on the surface. Um, a drop of oil released at 5,000 feet uh, takes about 24 hours to reach the surface. So as it's coming up, a lot of those VTEX components, those light ends, the benzenes, toluenes, uh, are all dissolving into the water for the most part. Uh, you can still get, I could still smell them on the surface, but they would be in the dissolved component. And the, the underwater plume will be drifting, contrary to the surface currents, be drifting in different directions. We, for the first time ever, we finally got a, uh, a Doppler current meter down there to see what those currents were actually doing, and they are doing unexpected things. So what you see in the sheen, the surface, and the, the big gyres up there, the, the gulf uh, gyre, uh, is not what's going on down below. So I think that's enough for me. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question from a, a somebody in the back who wrote on a note card. Um, if dispersants are breaking up the surface area of the oil coming to the surface, what is being done to address the quantity of the oil in the water other than hoping microorganisms consume it? Well, I think they were using skimmers to pick up what they could on the surface. And they were, had the booms absorb what they could. And they had some other, you know, they think there was that thing about uh, <laughs> donating your hair, so how your hair absorbed the oil. But other than that, they're just hoping that dispersants break it up and bacteria eats it and the stuff uh, disperses throughout the ocean. The solution to pollution is dilution. Well, I heard nothing in, in his uh, speech that contradicted the outside. They don't really know where it's, where it's going. It's just visually not evident anymore. Uh, they, they did one thing which I'd seem like good from a simple mind point of view is when it was at the service, they, you know, set the oil on fire finally out of desperation, and, you know, took the smoke damage up front and got, you know, got the oil out of the ocean at any rate and just added it to, you know, the air pollution we already had. And that also seemed like a much better solution than, this, than dispersing it evenly, invisibly throughout the environment. And he can still smell it by God. That means it's still there. You know, I could go on and on about that. The problem with burning the oil off the surface was, you know, they were catching turtles and other uh, mammalian species in the, in the fires that were occurring. They were killing other animals doing the burn off, and as well as the air pollution that's caused by them. So there, you know, there's no good solution. The whole point of this thing is we need to have prevention. We need to not let these things happen. And if they do happen, we need to have solutions that are robust and can be put in place quickly. And that, of course, costs funding and costs money and costs upfront expenditures in this stuff. You know, I think that the whole lesson here is we need to prevent. You know, trying to deal with these things after they happen is a lose-lose situation, whether it's ecologically or scientifically or whatever it is, it's just a lose-lose. There's a lot, enormous damage to human health, environmental health, and the degradation of the environment is going to be take decades to recover. And these are, you know, it's manageable more quickly. There are some sense, I don't think totally preventable, but there's certainly a lot more manageable than what we had here if we have the right tools and equipment in place. And you know, we have more robust blowout preventers. We have a lot more safety. Remember, there were 11 people killed on that rig. You know, the enormous loss of life, as well as the people injured on that rig when this thing blew up. And there, you look at the look through the history, and you know, drilling oil wells, drilling is a very hazardous occupation. There's a lot of people have been killed doing that. And I don't remember the numbers. Maybe somebody over there remembers the numbers of people killed. But you know, there's been a lot of people injured and killed on these rigs. And you know, what's that all about? It's being not being putting safety up front, not going slow enough, not for investing in safe procedures, both for the workers as well as the environment. We have time for a couple more questions, if anyone has one. About how long does it take for the oil dispersants to disperse, or you know, what concentration would they be in? after a certain length of time? You know, the oil dispersants react act pretty quickly when they're sprayed on the surface. And, you know, the, you can see and you can watch the videos. You can actually do this experiment at home. You can take your average, uh, you know, kitchen or bathroom cleaner 
and uh, get it out. Put, take like a little bowl of water, put some uh, olive oil in it, or better yet, take the, go to your, get the dipstick out of your car, put a little car oil in it, and then spray your, um, you know, your detergent right on top of that oil. And you can see it, it, it breaks that oil up pretty quickly, reacts. And it, it does depend on you agitate it, it'll work a little better. That's why agitation is really important on the surface. It's, it's, you know, the wave actions and the temperature is really important with that. You can probably do a little experiment, put this stuff in the refrigerator and see if it's cold. It'll take, it'll be more slowly if it doesn't react when you don't shake it and things like that. So you can do your own little, I thought about doing a little demonstration here, but I figured it'd make a big mess out of things and the restaurant wouldn't <laughs> like it. But they react quickly. It like, uh, you know, it's like what we do when we put our detergents into our, our laundry. You know, they, it takes the oil off pretty quickly. Or you put a, you spill something on that, you put a little detergent on that oil droplet on your napkin or your tablecloth, and it breaks it up pretty quickly. We have one more note card question. Um, what happens when the microorganisms eating the oil have a population explosion? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, the question is, are they going to have a population explosion after eating the oil, or is it toxic to them? And I think it's one of the things, you know, some of the soaps and detergents we use are bacterial static in the sense that they kill bacteria and will uh, will damage the organism so they can't reproduce. So the, if they do rapidly reproduce, like there's some bacteria that are built to digest methane and some of the oils and that are naturally seep out of the Gulf, if these things explode in population, then you get that depletion of oxygen. That's sort of what I bring up with that uh, gentleman. You get oxygen depletion, which kills off all the other organisms that are down there. So that's sort of a lose-lose too. And right now there are just reports that there was another very large, the size of New Hampshire or something, dead sea zone out there in the Gulf area, independent of this oil thing, but those big areas of oxygen depletion destroy all the mammals and all the crabs and all the other organisms that depend on oxygen. So it, it's, um, you know, you have a population explosion can be really bad too. I mean, that's what happens when we have these big, uh, you know, even here up on Hood Canal area where we have all that sewage that seeps into Hood Canal and causes, you know, explosion of the bacteria, which causes a dead zone depletion of oxygen so the fish and other things can't swim through it. So it's a, you know, this whole thing is just, no matter how you look at it, there's no good solution to having a big spill like this. And the focus has to be on prevention. We have to have a bigger focus on human and environmental health. And we need to hold our legislative, our congressional, and our state legislative folks responsible for this stuff. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have this evening. Uh, let's all thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. And I, I would like to thank the organizers, too. I think we should have a big hand for Jen and the other people. And I'm sorry, the name is Wendy. Wendy and Wendy here for organizing this stuff and making this stuff happen tonight. It's, I think it's very important that we talk about science and talk about how science interacts with our human health and environment and understand these issues better. I think it's great what you folks are doing making this stuff happen. The KCTS, too, for filming this thing is awesome.